Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Clinton Sharp, and my uh, topic is value raising. Sorry, sorry. Um, as mentioned, my sponsor is the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. Just a little background. Um, our company is based in uh, Port Lincoln, South Australia. And uh, my grandfather came out from Europe in the 50s with his wife and his sis her sister and his brother-in-law. And uh, my grandfather was a joiner by trade. He uh, built his first vessel by hand with his brother-in-law in Sydney sailed around to Port Lincoln and uh, pioneered, pioneered the industry that is. And uh, the industry's grown to be stated as Australia's seafood capital. We uh, farm southern bluefin tuna for the Japanese sashimi market, and uh, we invested in the uh, wild catch of Spencer Kings. This is the uh, prawn that I base my uh, entire report around. This prawn prefers the cooler waters of southern Australia and is uh, why and how this flavour and texture of this prawn is so great in comparison to its uh, warmer cousins. My role as an upwood scholar was to discover ways to increase returns without adding pressure to fish stocks and neutral grounds. My findings are relevant to the broader domestic prawn industry with one investigating new technologies and how they can be applied in Australia learn about management practices in other fisheries and identify how those can improve performances in the Spencer Gold fishery. <coughs> identify how product differentiation will improve prawn prices using an internationally recognised accreditation system such as the MSC certification. The SA fishery you can see is displayed in green. Now we have uh, I guess over the last 25, 30 years, we've consistently taken around 2,000 tonnes from the Gulf. And uh, the trawl hours have been cut by about 60% over 23 years. This is achieved by reducing the fishery from 300 nights a year to, to a mere 50 nights. Now, the number of vessels in the Spencer Gulf has remained at 39 since 1975, when it was increased from 34 to 39. 85 to 90% of our annual catch is taken in less than 15% of the Gulf, which is around this Wallaroo region. And this demonstrates how the fishery has minimised its environmental footprint by decreasing the area in which the prawns are harvested. We don't have a strict total allowable quota. Um, we'll tend to leave the Spencer Gulf is regulated by a real-time management system. And Spencer Gulf is one of the only fisheries in the world that operate in this manner. It is the reason the FAO, Fisheries Food and Agriculture Organisation, of the United Nations has accredited Spencer Gold Fishery as the world's best managed fishery, or one of. Also earlier this year, the trawl fishery was awarded um, the MSC certification, which is endorsed by the WWF. It's the first to do so in the Southeast Asia region. Now, this leads me to the pie chart. And uh, you can see here that Queensland has a 37% share of the King Prawn caught in Australia. But this is a bit of an anomaly because the prawns caught here in this state are Eastern Kings as opposed to Western. But, so for the purposes of my report, I have, have to include Queensland as the King Prawn. But because under fish name standards, these two groups have been amalgamated as a generic King Prawn species. But it's still argued that the Western King is superior in taste, texture, and has a shelf life of about three times that greater than that of its northern neighbour, and this is reflected in price. In reality, the world's largest biomass concentration of commercially caught Western Kings is in the Spencer Gulf, South Australia, followed by Shark Bay and WA with, a, with half the amount of around 1,100 tonnes. Now, the entire planet has been enduring the global financial crisis, as we all know. China manages to increase her GDP by around 10% annually, although last year it dropped to 7.5. The China factor is the very reason that Australians are faced with such a powerful currency at present, and the term two-speed economy is used frequently by our economists. So our Asian cousins have certainly played their role in decreasing secret exports by inadvertently inflating the Aussie dollar. And European countries such as Germany and Denmark boast a 20 to 25% value-added tax on goods being imported into their country. 
Now that's on top of a 12% import duty on seafood products. As the graph shows here, the export value of, um, out of Australia has declined rapidly since 2000. Now, however, the imported culture prawn has more than doubled. The Venomine tiger prawn grown in the Asia region has improved to a point where it is now able to compete for a larger slice of our prawn market. Several years ago, the grades imported were no larger than 1620, which is a medium to small prawn. Now we're seeing 1015s, which are medium large, and even U10s being imported at a very high quality. As the cost of living rises, people are opting for these cheaper alternatives rather than a fresh wild core product. So the global supply of shrimp has risen from three to six million tonnes in just over a decade. Three million tonnes originates from farm prawns with a balance taken from wild stocks. Farm shrimp is the most rapidly growing source of um, supply, particularly the Venomite prawn farm here in Thailand. Thailand produces around half a million metric tonnes and consumes about 15% of that, exporting 425,000 tonnes. China, however, last year increased her production of Venomite from 1 million to a massive 1.5 million tonnes. The domestic market consumes about 900,000 of this. Australian culture prawn is dwarfed at around 4,000 tonnes, as you can see there. Now, we're a small but significant <coughs> sector of the global seafood pie. Domestic wild caught prawn is 2,000 tonnes which is 0.3% of world supply. <coughs> Australian king prawn is a mere 0.1%, but netting about 113 billion. <coughs> then I moved to Europe, and um, when there I was fortunate to have a meeting with the sales director of the Asia region, <coughs> the Royal Greenland, Mr. Finn Larson. And uh, Mr. Larson believes that the markets for Spencer Kings within Europe lie with Spain, Italy and France. Now these countries represent people who have valued their seafood above all else. And they felt firsthand the disaster of mismanaged fisheries. When I was in Set France here, I was asked by one Russian fisherman on the wharf, now where have all the fish gone? I, I just shrugged my shoulders and smiled at the guy. Now according to local fishermen, many vessels have been forced to tie it up like this due to dwindling stock numbers, leaving only smaller <coughs> fish and juveniles to be caught. And that's poor economy in anyone's language. Mr. Larson also commented that traditional, traditionally Scandinavian countries such as Norway, Denmark and Finland do not want to pay high prices for their seafood. They have an ingrained belief that fish is a poor man's food. And this is a way of thinking that dates back many decades and it'll be very hard to break. When I was in Belgium, I had a meeting with uh, Mr. Jerome Lamont from Satraco. Now, they tried selling, selling scallops into Germany without not much success at all. So they've decided to source scallops that were uh, certified sustainable with an MSC logo. Now, results were almost instantaneous, seeing a 30% jump in price. And so, for this very reason, Satraco agreed to meet with me and discuss possibilities for a relationship to develop with Spencer Golf Industry and the Belgian company. So companies such as Tesco, Lions, Marks and Spencer based in the UK are the main drivers of MSC and are creating a new wave of demand for sustainable products. MSC is very much in vogue at the moment. And according to Mr Bjorn Hansen, shrimp expert of Royal Greenland, there's no direct financial benefit when comparing the certified shrimp they sell from, Ca from Canada against the shrimp out of Greenland. And they're saying that Royal Greenland are currently undergoing the certification process as they see it a must going forward. Now, when I was in London, one of the things I do for on my travels was to call into the odd fishmonger and see what they had in their window. And I happened to stumble upon the very prawn my report is based around. And I asked the junior monger behind the store um, if he knew the origin of the prawns. And um, he responded to me that they were from Mozambique. And I looked at him, really, and I said, uh, you might want to pass me on to your store manager. Anyway, the store manager came over and he informed me that the, uh, 
coins were very much Australian and they'd been sourced by the, the owner of the store when he was in Australia last year. He loved them so much he had to have them in all three of his stores. Now you can see they were, he was selling them for a whopping 25 pound a kilo which equates to about $40. And that grade of prawn generally sells for less than half that. This fishmonger also informed me of um, clients that weren't so happy with the product in the terms that, as you can see from the quote, she didn't know if she wanted to buy something that had travelled that far. Now, this had me thinking about where the system is breaking down. And people don't know enough when it comes to what they're actually putting in their mouth, particularly when it comes to food. Education is very underrated. The global public needs education on processing and processing practices. Advertising quality standards, country of origin labelling, sustainability of product will alleviate most of the doubts consumers have when it comes to deciding what they'll take home when next visit is visiting their Monday. So as you can see, over 15 years, you know, we've seen that we're receiving a 10% less price than what we were 15 years ago. You combine this with the fact that the cost per kilo increased by almost 40%. The big issue is that prawn fish is predominantly a price takers as opposed to price makers. We need to change and we need innovation. So, it was in the Isle of Skye, Scotland, I met scampi fisherman Callum McKinnon Sr. and his son Callum Jr. And I had learned from these fishermen that their prawn industry was doing it tough in the early 90s when prices for the fresh market were dwindling. Now, this forced fishermen to be inventive and innovative with their product and experiment with the live market. As a result, their industry became very profitable. And this seeded the idea of doing something similar with the Western Kings. And I discovered trials that had been done back in the late 90s using chilled sawdust and cold anesthetization methods, similar to those used for the farm Karuma prawn. Now the cultured Karuma prawn were fetching prices as high as $300 a kilo back in the early 90s, up until the disease hit in 93. Dropping prices combined with the difficulty of costs of Dealing with the nocturnal species, meaning working at night, logistics, it just, the industry fell apart. You know, they're predominantly farming tigers or monodons for the uh, domestic market. So from the trials done in the Western Kings, because uh, they're a very similar species to the uh, Karuma prawn, uh, survival rates were down at about 80%. Now, to make the idea viable, rates would need to be up at 95% plus. And with the advancements in technologies that we currently have in place, I believe that this is achievable. Yeah. This is um, a couple of proposals that I've put together for industry. I sit on the management board of um, Spencer Gold for Industry, and we, um, <coughs> we're going through a phase now where, where we do need change, and we need some innovation, and we need some new ideas and new way of thinking. Now, 30 years ago, there was not such an emphasis on large fish, and hence there was more prawn numbers being targeted, allowing for an expansion in the fleet. And with the aid of improved technologies and the evolving knowledge of the Gulf, the large fish have become more accessible to fishermen, <coughs> and as a result, the fisheries experience record numbers of juvenile kings, but declining numbers of the more profitable larger grade, and it posed serious doubt as to whether 39 vessels can be sustained in the Gulf under the management practices we currently run under. Taking out seven vessels would give each remaining license holder an extra 11 tonne per season, which equates to about $160,000. So, seven licenses at a value of, say, $4 million, because now would be the time to do it, because license value is probably half that what it was 10 years ago, when it was up around $8, 9000000 million. Now, that leaves 32 licenses remaining in the Gulf, $28 million, that's about 875 k a year, divided by 10 years, so 10 year, 10 year term away. So minus 30% wages, crew wages, company tax, cost insurance, licensing fees. You're looking at about a $45,000 profit. Take that off of the $87,500 a year. You know, you're looking at 43,000 out of pocket expenses at a 5% interest. And this obviously decreases over the 10 year loan of the 10-year um, period loan uh, as the principal is reduced. Now since government allowed five extra licenses back in 75, it would be reasonable that uh, the industry requests that the government give us a guaranteed or reduced interest rate loan. You now, this particular scenario would be the simplest method of adding value back to the industry without need for current real time management to be altered. A much simpler alternative to that of transferable rights or quota or gear units or nights. 
So it's not the way the fishery is run that is the issue. It's simply the fact that fishing technologies have rapidly evolved. And Spencer Gulf is now having to keep pace. And as my old man always says, there's, there's too many snouts in the trough for too many years. And the second proposal is the amalgamation proposal. Now, an amalgamation proposal is designed to reduce the fleet size down from 39 to 26 without any shared cost to the industry. This is achieved by having one of every three licences coalescing, so 13 different companies are formed. Each company consisting of three licences, but only two vessels. And it is integral that each of the 13 newly formed companies sell one of their vessels, one of the three vessels, hence reducing the fleet size by a third. So 39 licences in each of the 13 companies would need to become unitised. So as a scenario, say each licence is worth 50 units, so one tonne per, one unit per tonne, giving each company a value of 150 units. Each member has the ability to trade their share, either wholly or partially, giving much more flexibility to stakeholders. But the merging stage of the process for individual license holders would need to be in an open forum, allowing two stakeholders who wish to stay in the fishery the ability to amalgamate with the license holder who's looking to get out or has the intention of selling, either wholly or partially because of the unitized system. I know there's still a lot to take in, but it also allows two stakeholders with larger newer trawlers to merge with third party who is in possession of a smaller size or ageing vessel. Now, the disadvantage is that, you know, the only major disadvantage I can see is that the pro with this proposal is the fact that business decisions are now shared and no longer will license owners have the sole control over their vessel business. So this moves me on to when I was in Denmark and I was, met Mr. Leif Andersen, owner of Intec International. And this company primarily caters for cold water shrimp, <coughs> but uh, has designed and engineered equipment suitable for the king crawfish fishery. Now, the latest piece of equipment only recently released is the Connie 500 continuous hooker. If vessels are catching more due to buyback or amalgamation, it would be essential for industry to look at such equipment. The Connie 500 has a 500 litre capacity and is capable of cooking up to 800 kilograms per hour with a three minute cooking time. There is also an improved version of a Connie 800, which does about 1,500 uh, kilo in, a, in an hour with a three-minute cooking time. There's also the second piece of equipment is the bycatch separator. Uh, this is useful in certain prawn fishes around Australia, where this machine separates small fish from the prawn based on the principle that fish coming up with the trawl shrimp possess different abilities to attach themselves to the conveyor belt. And this takes away a lot of labour and speeds up the process much. So here are the recommendations. In summary, investigate options for advertising stringent food safety standards in overseas markets. This can be managed through the ACPF, which is the Australian Council of Prawn Fishers, which is the governing body overall industry. And the request for the ACPF to pursue appropriate product labelling and species, country of origin, and sustainability. This needs to be addressed in Australia first and then flow through to working with other countries, particularly where our product is exported. And conduct further research on methods and technologies to export live product, investigate options for export of live product, the country where product would be purchased, and investigate options for buyback of seven licenses in Spencer Gold. And this is working with government and license holders to determine appropriate mechanisms, i.e. interest rates, loans, how licenses can be bought back, etc. The sixth one is investigate options for license amalgamation, in terms of each group, fishery management changes, additional nights, catch rates, how groups will be formed, governance of groups, Etc. And lastly, but as I just showed you, investigate new technologies to support processing on board the vessel. So this led me to this is where I winded up, and we were, at, uh, we were in London earlier this year for the Contemporary Scholars Conference, and I was fortunate enough to meet His Royal Highness the Duke of Gloucester, the Queen's first cousin. He's a huge uh, he's a huge advocate for Nuffield and, and the Nuffield brand. It's uh, certainly a great man to have on side. Um, thank you to my comrades, my global focus group. They were just a sensational bunch of guys and <laughs> friendships we'll have for life. I took this one earlier on in the trip before we actually left. And just fed everything to dinner. <laughs> um, special thank you to my wonderful wife. Uh, she, um, yeah, she endured a lot. I was away for a long time. And Two days into our Global Focus Tour, she rang up and told me that uh, she was pregnant with our second son. So, uh, yeah, she, uh, 
I was away for a lot of the pregnancy, but fortunately I was there for the birth. And, uh, and our two boys, Orlando and Daniel. Thank you so much. And finally, Nuffu Australia, I couldn't have done it without you. And uh, FRDC, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you all. Well, I mean, I don't know how you left those guys behind. Um, fantastic. Any anyone game to ask Clint a question? Yeah. Uh, Reese Rangio, WA Scholar. Clint, well done, mate. Congratulations on finishing up. Uh, with the MSC certification, just wondering what kind of premium you guys saw in the market uh, immediately after you achieved that. Yeah, well, like I said, um, we had the company Citraco contact us, and um, you can see from the exports that we basically were down to zero exports um, prior to this year. And this year, the, um, there were four containers sent from our industry alone. So there was, you know, basically, um, the results were instantaneous. So yes, you, I know that uh, you guys have recently achieved your MSC and you should see some good things from it. It's arguable, arguable whether the, you're going to get a value, an increase in value of price, but um, I think it's a necessity moving forward, especially with the way people are thinking about food and sustainability. Yeah. <coughs> Terry? Yeah, of course, Terry. <laughs> Clint, uh, is it true, really, that you only work 50 days a year? <laughs> <laughs> so, does golf count? <laughs> yeah. It's hard to maintain a um, No, it's not true. We're, we're at sea in the prawn game, we're at sea for 50 nights. Plus, there's because um, we're a self managed fishery, we do our own stock assessment. So, there's, uh, there's also added nights. There's probably another 10 nights there of stock assessment. <laughs> uh, I'm leaving. Uh, and uh, like I said, we farm southern bluefin tuna, so um, the tuna season is over the summer months, and we're not actually prawning over. We only prawn November, December, and March, April, May, June, and we catch our prawn over the summer months, so December, January, February, and they're brought back and they're fattened you know, over three months until they shipped off to Japan. Huge market. So yes, there is work I do. Sorry, Paul. Um, yeah, go ahead. Just, just on the marketing side, um, you didn't touch much on that, but I did hear a whisper that you were going to give significant discounts of regular suppliers to Nuffield Scholars. <laughs> that was the fine clause in my Nuffield contract, wasn't it? <laughs> or was that just SA? Yeah. I use a microphone. I'm going to do an uphill thing now, make a statement. Um, and I just, uh, it's not a question, because the world only a great presentation, and you got a lot from it. But I want to congratulate the uh, the immediate uh, management of South Australia, Nuffield. Um, over the last four years now, um, <coughs> they've managed to achieve a corn fisherman, a tuna fisherman, a cray fisherman, a oyster farmer uh, <laughs> into Nuffield, South Australia. The challenge is now to get a King George White fishing. <laughs> well, we'll have a seafood basket then. <laughs> well, I can say something controversial, but I won't. We don't catch any of those in there. <laughs> okay, Clint, well, uh, I think everyone's very impressed with uh, you actually really making things happen and um, could just be the best thing since Maccabee Diva to come out of Port Lincoln. So Terry, if you want to come forward and present you with your plaque.